easy for our brothers and sisters in Gaza. May Allah give victory to them, make the ground under them firm, pour upon them his mercy from above them, protect them from all directions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroy the oppressors and the enemies and those who harm and butcher the innocent. Allahumma ameen. Uh, we're blessed, alhamdulillah, to have with us none other than Dr. Haifa Yunus, alhamdulillah, who is no stranger to any of us. And uh, I asked her to come, alhamdulillah, for a very specific reason. Um, we have been witnessing miracles and pain at the same time. Uh, one of the things, subhanAllah, that we have to reconcile is that we are both brokenhearted for the people of Gaza, as well as full in our hearts out of all of them. And uh, we're trying to talk about different topics. And one of the things in particular was the women of Gaza and what they inspire. There's something very specific that they inspire in us. When we talk about Nisa, how the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how the Rasul, the women around the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the way that the heroes like Nusayba radiallahu ta'ala anha and Umm Sulaim radiallahu anha and so many their stories come out and we're seeing a living example. And this has been one of the things that we've taken from this era are things that we only saw in the Sahaba when we read about them and we're seeing them right now in the people of Gaza. And so uh, Dr. Haifa, welcome, alhamdulillah, welcome to our channel once again. Jazakumullah khair, Shaykh Omar, it's always a pleasure to be here. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. I fully agree with everything you said. There is two emotions inside everybody, sometimes even three, I will say. Personally, I have three. There is definitely sadness. There is mixed with anger. There is part which is happy, and some people may, may be surprised. Happy to see what we read in books. We are seeing it in reality. The strength, the yaqeen, the faith. And... The fact is, and I am talking about myself, how can I compare myself with what we are seeing? Mm -hmm. Meaning what they are going through, how strong they are, how they are taking it, men and women and children, mm -hmm. and they're still going. Their faith, if anything, is stronger. Mm -hmm. And I look at myself, subhanAllah, can you all of us go through, none of us, I don't think anybody listening to us in the Western world have gone through what they are, what they have gone and still going. And I don't know, I always ask myself, how would I have responded if I was there? Right. You know what I'm saying? In, in Arabic, I love this. You learn from them what strength, really strength mean, not claim, and what steadfastness is. They are attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing comes out of their mouth. غير ما يرضي ربنا يعني القلب يحزن والعين تدمع ولا نقول إلا ما يرضي ربنا what a nation what a nation سبحان الله nobody knew this till Allah made us see it see it all of us live سبحان الله الله أكبر well سبحان الله they are the people of يقين right yes. so to us we we talk about certainty as something we hope to generate inside of us they are people of يقين and you know, Sheikh Tahir Wyatt once said something that, that really resonated with me and it stuck with me. Um, you know, when I was uh, pitching the idea of the first and talking about the Sahaba on such a regular and recurring basis. And he said, you know, This is the firsts are a tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha, the, the path of those who Allah Azza wa Jal is pleased with. And they feel so distant and unreal. And subhanAllah, you see people and, and really um, they feel so unreal, but they feel they feel so near this time. They don't feel distant. They they look like our kids. They look like our they look like ourselves, you know, and they don't they don't seem to be like us. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them and uh, protect them. And again, I think it's it's interesting because we 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 have these two conflicting emotions we want to help them so bad but they're helping us we don't want to turn them into just this theater for us we we want to help them we want to be there for them in any way that we can and that's something that we're we're trying our best with the night and we ask Allah Azza Jal to to guide us to the ways that are pleasing to him and that are beneficial to them Allahumma ameen 
But mm -hmm. I, I want to get started, Dr. Haifa, when we talk about Sahabiyat, when we talk about the the women around the Prophet Sallallahu and what what sort of has come out. So I'll, I'll start from my end. I think a lot of times there are the known Sahabiyat, right? The ones that we know very well. And one thing that I always find uh, very inspiring from the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are the women that not too many people know. And so I, I mentioned in my khutbah uh, last week, uh, Zanira radiallahu ta'ala anha, who was being tortured with Sumayya radiallahu anha. And, uh, you know, she was one of the people being tortured. And uh, Abu Jahal beat her to a point that she lost her eyesight. And Abu Jahal said, uh, when when even some of the enemies of Islam told Abu Jahal, calm down, you're going too far. He said, Qad a'mat al-aliha. So the, the gods, Allatul Uzza, made her blind. And she said in the middle of that torture, she said, Allatul Uzza have no power. It's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who makes blind and who gives sight. Faraddallahu basaraha. Allah Azza wa brought back her eyesight. So these miracles that happen in the midst of the tragedy, which we're seeing in Gaza, right? Miracles in the midst of the tragedy that remind you, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. Uh, Allah Azza wa is sending you these signs. In the matter of Siri Yuswa, sabran ya al Gaza. Be patient, be patient. Your place is Jannah. There are other women that come to my mind. One other person, subhanAllah, and because she's very unknown. Raita uh, bint al-Harith, radiallahu ta'ala anha. Raita bint al-Harith made hijrah with her husband and her four children to Abyssinia, to Habasha. And then when she heard about uh, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi settling in Medina, she made her way to Medina. And they didn't find clean water on the way. SubhanAllah. And this was just a story that came to my mind because people are dying from water as well. And uh, she and three of her four children drank water that wasn't clean. And uh, her husband, who was also named Al-Harith, and one of her children woke up and found the rest of them dead. Mm -hmm. SubhanAllah. Imagine a person of two hijras, a person whose name is not known. You say, Raita bint Al-Harith, what does it mean to people? But this was a woman of two hijras, a woman who was a martyr on the way of the hijra with her children. And why? Because she drank water that wasn't clean in very cruel circumstances. They didn't go to Abyssinia because a great masjid was built there. They went to Abyssinia to, because that was the only way they could flee and have their iman. And then they were going to Medina because that was the only way they could flee and have their iman. So stories upon stories upon stories of these people. So, but I want to ask you, which women from the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whose, whose memory was invoked? You had a powerful series in Ramadan, mashallah, with Jannah Institute, where you talked about women uh, throughout history, who came, to, who comes to your mind as you're seeing this all play out in front of you? Sheikh Omar, subhanAllah, uh, as we say, which one? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I, I look at the Sahabi, uh, the one we know, the one we don't know, or many people don't know. I look at them as, as flowers. And all of them are beautiful, but there's some flowers you love them more, not for any reason, just that's, they resonate, they look resonate or feel. Basically, my role model, which I was when I was looking at the ladies or the the woman of Gaza, two came to my mind. The one which so dear to me, which is Sayyida Aisha, and Umm Salama. It's a completely two different women, one opposite to the other from many things. But when you look at them, and I wondered, I was like, if Sayyida Aisha was in Gaza, or Sayyida Umm Salama, right? I mean. I, I can't say what I will do, but I can see when they were tested because the test is not always fear. The test can be fear. The test can be sadness. The test can be when you are hurt deeply, deeply hurt. And when you read the Sayyidah Aisha, always comes to my mind, of course, Hadithatul Ifik, because that's very painful to a woman. I mean, the man feels it, but it is a woman pain when you are innocent, you haven't done anything in the most honorable thing for you. Who are you? Who's your father? Who's your husband? And then you know what's the painful side? It's when your husband, in a minute, maybe he was, he has doubt about your innocent. So here, imagine this moment. I looked at the woman of Gaza and I said, they have doubts. Are they going to live in the next minute or two? You've, you've seen so many of these videos right this could be the last one the physician who died who recorded right she and her family all and says this is probably the the way she was speaking what is this calmness 
She's not saying I'm going to go next. I'm going to go to vacation. Oh, I'm going to the operating room. So I looked at the Sayyid Aisha and I said, when the moment of pain, severe pain, when he asked her and told her, say it. If you have done it, say it and ask Allah for forgiveness and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you. What did she feel? And then when she looked at her father and he didn't say a thing, looked at her mother, what will they say? Nothing. You know this moment? I feel it's the moment of the woman and the people of Gaza. When you really say inside you, Mali illallah, I have no one but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when she reached that moment, Nasrullah immediately came in. When she said, I'm not going to say anything. I'm turning my back. I'm going to say, ma qalahu Aba Yusuf. Sabrun jameel. Wallahu al-musta'an wa ala ma tasifun. Beautiful patient. And Allah is my helper against what you are saying. This is the woman of Gaza these days. When you look at them, and I just before we came together, I saw a clip. I don't know if you've seen it. The woman who just started the museum in Rafah. She opened it in 2022. Ya Allah, you know what also really struck me? Have you seen anybody in Gaza not dressed with hijab? Have you seen any woman? It's amazing. Lost the child looking for her Yusuf. You've seen it, right? Coming to the hospital, look between the bodies, and they still dressed properly. Dressed the way pleases Allah. So when I looked at the Sayyid Aisha and I said, if she was in Gaza, she probably would have said the same. When Malana illallah, there is no one except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And she would have looked and said, Sabrun Jameel, Wallahu al Musta'an, beautiful, patient, because that's what they have. Then I look at Umm Salama. You know, I I personally I always say this to the woman. It's beautiful for the woman to be emotional. It's beautiful. Otherwise, you can't be a mother. But at the same time, you need to be strong. The way pleases Allah and wise. And when you think of wisdom, you think of Umm Salama, the famous story when she told the Rasul, she literally saved the Ummah, is how I call it. She saved the Ummah because if they did not, which probably will never have happened, but if, and we say if, they didn't listen to Rasul what would have happened? How did Allah alhamaha that idea that Rasul was so emotionally moved and couldn't believe they didn't listen to him, didn't think of it. So I thought if Umm Salama was in Gaza now and the choice is, is stay in your home and you're probably going to die or you need to take whatever you can take and walk five miles or ten, five or ten Right, and Allah knows if you're gonna reach because also you're gonna are you are exposed. We are seeing it. What would what decision she would have made? How she would have convinced her family? Let's leave. Allah will give us better. You know what it means to leave your home? Ya Allah, Ya Allah. I mean, you saw it yesterday. It's so painful. Subhanallah. None of us can feel it. Yani the way they are feeling it because they are there. What would she have? decided what she would have told me or you if we were there and we were asking her right subhanallah you learn from them and many nusayba subhanallah ar rasul bi khair you're not worried about anything else what you learn from them and i think this is all women especially need to learn is that doesn't matter what you are going through again in your home in the community in the country globally don't forget your connection with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you know you are connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what is the first thing come out of your mouth when you are exposed or when you are put suddenly in that situation. And that's what you see with the people of Gaza, men and women. You've seen that man who came. Ya Allah, hadal, and I can't. And it's like, Ya Allah, give me what you gave him. The man who came in, two of his children, right? And he said, Ya Zalama, tabki. Hey, you're crying? Ya Allah, his children. This is what it is. We are here. This is dunya. You know what, what we teach? What we teach and we tell people? But this man is, is walking the talk. May Allah forgive me, Ya Rabbi. He is walking the talk and then he goes and do wudu. And he's doing salah because Allah gave him two martyrs. I think the women need to learn, all of us, me number one, and everybody is, is 
I say it, that hadith of Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam, ta'arraf ila Allahi farraha, ya'rifuka fa shidda. When we are, alhamdulillah, now living in our comfort, Rabbi lak alhamd, may Allah make us among the grateful. We need to use this time to know him well, not by name, but know him, connect to him, depend on him. So if, and may Allah protect us, we Allah We ask Allah always health and safety. If he tested us, then the first thing comes out of our mouth is what Sayyida Aisha said. And the, the decisions we make is what Ummu Salama did. And not emotional or others. Allah Akbar. That's a strong way to put it, subhanAllah. I think it, it's interesting because we, you're looking at these people as well. And one of the beautiful things about, as you mentioned, Nusayba bint Ka'b, um, um it's not like she had intended to be in the battlefield, right? right. But it was a situation that was forced upon her. I mean, her kids are falling yeah. in front of her. And she's still standing in front of the Prophet ﷺ with her sword uh, to defend the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. And her concern is 100% just the Prophet ﷺ's dua and the Prophet ﷺ's suhbah, like his companionship. And it's, it's one thing, subhanAllah, to hear someone simply say, Alhamdulillah. It's another thing to hear like a flow of clarity, a stream of clarity. Like you mentioned that man, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite him with his family around the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wallahi nastahi. Like it's it's just so shy. Like, how do I how do I how do I oh, how do I stand in front of Allah on a day that you're gonna stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? To hear the stream of clarity, like they're not they're speaking full sentences. Kaif, <laughs> how do you do that? Sadmat al the first strike, just yeah. alhamdulillah, in and of itself is 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 a thousand pounds on your back. How do you have a stream of clarity that comes out? And one of the things about the Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ is they had these streams of clarity that came out in these devastating moments, right? And anything they said was going to be so consequential because you literally had people there ready to record it. And then it shows up in our books today, 1,400 years later. Uh, how did they have such a stream of clarity? And I think the, the reality is, is that they saw the world for what it was before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took away their most precious possessions of this world. These people are under no illusion. It's not like they were living in, uh, you know, in in what they what they call the Singapore, you know the, right. the taunt the taunt of the enemies is uh, you know if only the people of Gaza would have focused on building a Singapore for themselves under Singapore. occupation and and, yes. and and shut off from the world around them and uh, no airport bombarded but, regularly cut I mean just no state no citizenship uh, cut off the fishing lines for them you know they can't yeah. even subhanallah look at the amount of oppression they even forbade them they shut the amount of, of miles that they could go out and fish for themselves. If only they would have built Singapore for themselves, right? These people were under no illusion of this world, the materialism of this world. And that's why when the most devastating thing happens to them in this world, they're still able to have this stream of clarity because they already had clarity about what this world was. And so they're facing cruelty like we've never seen before, and they have clarity like we've never seen before which is stunning us, subhanAllah, as we see it coming from them. And I think that is something that when you when you look at those women around the Prophet ﷺ, and again, the women, the men, they're all people of yaqeen, but specifically those women around the Prophet ﷺ that we're, we're talking about right now, we're talking about the women of Gaza. I look at a mother who's lost all of her children, right? And you had those types of women around the Prophet ﷺ, right? There was a great uncertainty. And subhanAllah, that messaging of we're not here for this world was so compelling that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was able to get buy-in from the men, from the women, from the children. It's not like you hear the stories, the countless stories of the night before Uhud, of the women telling their husbands, don't go. You hear the stories of the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, no undermining yeah. at the last moment but what you're hearing are stories of 
we're here for Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're here for something greater. We are pursuing something greater. We can bear greater pain because we seek a greater reward. And that is, at the end of the day, essential to us as people of Iman and people who aspire to be people of Yaqeen, people of certainty. I think, Sheikh Omar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I say this to myself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us see things, hear things, live things for a reason. As you know, the Sahaba used to say, we see the Quran as messages from Allah. Now we have, in addition to the Quran, is everything else is happening. The first question everyone should ask themselves, man and a woman, why not me? Right? We all say when things doesn't go our way, we say, why me? Right? I look at the people of Gaza and I, لا تراضى على حكمك يا ربي. Maybe because I'm not going to be able to take it. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعا. But the question, first thing I look and I say, why not me? And my answer is, وَقَانَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ عَظِيمًا The grace of Allah upon me. Number two is, now connect the Sahaba, connect the people of Gaza. Sahabiyat and Sahaba. Number one, the focus. Before tragedies comes in. When people go to, when they went to Abyssinia, they didn't think about anything else than pleasing Allah, and that's the right thing they need to do. When they went to Medina, even when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened the dunya for them, right? This came in Medina. Prophet, tell your wives, do you want the dunya and the beauty of this dunya? Come on in, I'll let you go. No harm feelings, nothing. Just go, choose. Choice. This or this. If I and you and all of us, at time of prosperity right now, we have made that choice. And by the way, that choice is harder than when we are under a, a test. I have all the choices of the world. I can do whatever I want. And by my choice and yaqeen and faith and certainty, I chose Allah. And it's not words. You know this. There's nothing cheaper than speaking, than words. But, but my actions fulfill the words I am saying. Allah, then Allah is number one. Show me, alayhi salatu wassalam, show me your sunnah. You really need the dar al-akhirah, then I am going to sacrifice in this dunya because some things, if I want them in this dunya, the akhirah is going to be difficult. When I live this way, I think this is the most important message. Wallahi, I feel, and correct me if I'm wrong, if the people of Gaza, with all the tragedy they are going through, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy and reward them abundantly. Mm -hmm. See the result of their tragedy. Not only the victory that we know it's going to come, but maybe the timing is in Allah's hand. But they see that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them go through changed us Muslims. What do you think they will say? That's why you said it in the beginning, and I'm saying to everybody, we cannot be the same people before October 7th. We can't, as Muslims, as living here, not only support, but our relationship with Allah has to change. Hasn't time come that the believers, their hearts surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Let's all make the choice. Let's make Allah, Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam, and the Dar al Akhirah is. Our priority, my let's live the dunya. Alhamdulillah, they lived. They lived in Medina. All the wives of Rasulullah. But the choice was always please Allah. So when they are tested, and again, the tests came in Medina. You know that the the answer comes very easily, exactly like the woman of Gaza, you see them right now. Right? They are sad, they're crying, but they're their focus is on Allah. I know Allah will reward me. I know I'll see you in Jannah. You don't say these things unless you really believe in them. When you're seeing your children. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us like them. I always say, Ya Rabbi, make them like that, like them. Don't test me. Don't test me because I don't know what I was gonna, how I'm going to react. But make me like them. When the dunya is in my hand and when the dunya you decide to take it from me, make me steadfast and say and act what pleases you.
دعاء السلام المطيع رحمه الله قال اللهم إن كنت بلغت أحد من عبادك الصالحين درجة ببلاء فبلغنيها بالعافية yeah, نعم الله if you have guided someone to a particular rank through test then guide me to that rank or grant me that rank بالعافية with, with ease you don't ask Allah for the test we're not we're not asking Allah to be tested like the people of Gaza we're asking Allah to have the blessing of the yaqeen of the people of Gaza and trying to relieve them of the trial that they are in so it's certainly we don't ask Allah for for the, the test itself uh, that's not the, the nature of our relationship as the man who young man who used to say uh, uh, oh Allah whatever it is that you were planning to punish me with in the hereafter punish me with punish it me the, here yeah and he and he said don't say it yeah he said La tultipuhu. you're not gonna be able to like, handle it. And, and so hello there are a few people that have actually they're not many, they're they're far and few in between, but but I've heard that sentiment, believe it or not. I've heard that sentiment, you know, from a few people that, you know, why couldn't we be tested like that? I wish I could be in Gaza right now. I say, listen, um, ask Allah to make it easy for them. Ask Allah for the rank. Ask Allah for the certainty. But Allah knows what he's doing. So, subhanAllah, this is, this is not our domain. And... It's and in we are as, if not even better, with our certainty and faith. Inshallah, inshallah. Yeah. So we ask Allah for pardon to be spared and to have that rank. Ya um, Rabbi, ameen. Ameen, Rabbi. Dr. Haifa, so no. Laysa bi amalina, bi fadli. Not by our deeds, by Allah's mercy. Um, Dr. Haifa. Uh, you obviously, I mean, I'm sure you've been hearing from the community as, as as I've been hearing from the community and everyone's kind of heard unique vantage points. Um, I know you run a lot of halaqas, sister halaqas. I'm just going to ask you, what are some of the conversations that you're having with women in our community right now in particular? And what conversations do you want to have with the broader ummah uh, that is tuning in? Of course, we have we have men and women tuning in, but I'm sure it's sure. going to be disproportionately women because of the subject. So what what are the questions you're being asked and what are what are some of the nasai, what are some of the advices that you've been giving to sisters? Well, number one, I always say the following. The question is like, why Allah is allowing this to happen? Um, where is the mercy of Allah, subhanAllah? But I'm sure they, the way they are asking it is not questioning. It's just, I want to see it. And what can I do? A lot of people are feeling helpless and hopeless. Hopeless and helpless. And we shouldn't. Again, time is in Allah's domain. So what I will say, Allah Rahman Rahim, I've said this so many places, subhanAllah. Allah Rahman Rahim all the time. Allah Rahman when he gave the Muslims victory in Badr, and Allah Rahman when they lost in Uhud. Allah Rahman when they were 30, 40 days in the trench, and then when they won, Allah is a Rahman. I need to know the Rahman and I need to see the Rahma in my daily life. When I look at my children and I'm getting them ready to go to school. Now, when I see the people of Gaza, where is the Rahma? Sometimes the Rahma takes time or the Rahma is not in the way I see it. Yani, when I was looking at all what we are all seeing and I remembered the feeling of Rasul when he signed the Treaty of al Hudaybiyah. Ya Allah, yani if the Sahaba couldn't, Sayyidina Umar couldn't, right? They couldn't, they didn't even let him put Rasulullah. And he said, if I know you're Rasulullah, we're not going to be having this, right? Imagine this is Rasulullah. Ya Allah, Abdi, Subhanallah, Asra bi Abdi. What was he feeling at that moment? So this is what I tell the woman. The feeling down, the feeling sad is, no, is normal, is expected. We are human. But la tay asum al rawhillah. إنه لا يأسم الروح الله للقوم الكافرون. السيدنا يعقوب said to his sons when he lost both of his children. We need to stay strong. One, we need to stay focused. Never be helpless. There is always things we can do. We can make dua as we all have been saying this. But I think number one, every Muslim hearing us, man and a woman, we need to do the following. We need to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
we need to put dunya number two. I'm not going to say leave dunya, but put dunya number two. Put Allah number one. This is a message to everybody. My ibad, my servants, wake up. This is dunya, how long you will live. This can change in a minute. Yani, people of Gaza, October 1st, they had plans like you and me. They had all these dreams like you and me. Subhanallah. And the same thing when we saw the earthquakes, when the earthquake in Turkey, the earthquake in... Things change in a minute. You do not depend all the time this is going to continue. You're ready. So that's number one, don't. What can I do? Physically, what I can do, again, I go back to Allah, number one. When I am close to Allah, my dua, you never know. Dua, one person can change everything. One person can change everything. Subhanallah, it's a true story. I lived it, Ya Sheikh Omar. We were in Mecca. Uh, this is a long time ago. It was the, one of the odd nights of the last 10 nights. And the, that year, they had severe drought. They haven't seen rain for, I think, months. And in the dua of al witr Fitahajud, the Imam raised his hand, and you know how many millions are there. And he said, Ya Allah, I remember it very well. He said, Ya Allah, if there is one righteous person among us, by his dua, send us rain. Wallahi, Ya Sheikh Omar. I left, I went to the airport. As we are going to the airport, the sky starts not raining, pouring. And I said, Ya Allah, who was that person? We should never underestimate what we can do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we need to be that righteous person. That righteous person. We cannot يعني, just keep looking at the videos and the and TV and listen to the news and we are just feeling frustrated. I didn't help them. And that's what I tell people. Don't feel helpless and don't feel hopeless. No. Yaqini billah la yataghayyar. And I say this to people, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you are asking me, where is the rahmah of Allah? Where, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let the Muslims suffer all the time in Mecca, 10 or 13 years? Why? Couldn't he give them the victory right away? Why did they lose in Uhud? Why did they have this in the, but why? Why did he, they won in Badr? Hadi hikmatullah. Me and you and all of us needs to have this yaqeen in me, inside me, that what I am seeing, khair, وَرَحْمَةً I am not seeing it. إِنَّا فَتَحْنَا لَكَ فَتْحًا مُبِينًا We gave you this clear victory. Where did it come? They signed the, the treaty. It was a defeat externally. It's all defeat. So this is what I tell people. And the, the fourth one, which I see, is people now becoming numb. Because it is more than a month now. And, you know, the same things are happening and happening and happening. Never. Never okay for any human being to suffer, not necessarily only in Gaza, wherever it is. We should not say, well, this is dunya, this is what's going to happen, life goes on. La, that's not pleasing Allah. Back to our, that's not pleasing to Allah. We still have to continue. Maybe change tactics. Maybe, yes, life will continue, but shouldn't continue the same way it was before October 7. Otherwise, may Allah forgive me, I didn't learn anything. Subhanallah. Um, no, I think that's very aptly put. And, and one of the things you mentioned, how one dua can change so many things. You know, a lot of times we've been asking about how one dua we make can change things for the people of Gaza. It may be that one of them makes a dua that doesn't just change their situation, but changes the situation of the ummah around the world. You know, subhanAllah. And that's something that is all within the domain of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one of the most frequent dua I make it for everybody, including myself. Ya Allah, bring us back to your beautiful Islam a beautiful in a beautiful way, not by test. No, but in a beautiful way, the way it pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And maybe one make that dua on that Friday before Maghrib or when they are fasting before they put that date in their mouth. That could change everything. Allahumma amin. Allahumma amin. And, and subhanAllah, we're seeing, I think most people would report and, you know, we're doing our studies right now on, on the effect of this on religiosity and how it's been. Um, most people would report that they've had somewhat of a return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And alhamdulillah, around the, the world, I think we're seeing a return of 
the ummah to being an ummah to some extent, right? At least the, the people in the ummah, not necessarily at the leadership level, but the people at the ummah uh, level who are finding that connection, that resonance with their entire ummah. I'm going to ask you one more question, Dr. Haifa, because it's a specific question um, regarding, you know, when it comes to women and, you know, some of the questions that we've been getting, because I've gotten this question a few times. So obviously, alhamdulillah, you have brothers and sisters that are participating in many of the actions that everyone's participating in, right? The dua, the, uh, the, the demonstrations, the boycotting, the participating in whatever we can. And it's been an inspiring effort from our entire community in that regard. Uh, but one of the specific questions has been from mothers who maybe are feeling burdened already by what comes with being a mom. And like, you know, I've I've heard, I'm going to give you a very specific sentence that I heard. And then maybe you can, you can, inshallah, ta'ala speak to this sister. She said, I was already struggling to find time to get my kids ready for school, take care of the home, deal with what I have to deal with just have my salah, my vikr. And now I can't stop watching videos. And I feel like I'm even more, uh, she she used the words, I'm, I'm being very honest, because this was this is what it's like being an imam. She said, I feel even more useless than I already was. She used that word. And of course, I had to comfort her and explain to her that your dua, your vikr, your participation, wherever you can, we're, we're all in the same place in some regard. What do you say to someone, though, that feels like I'm already specifically burdened by, you know, this isn't a world that rewards motherhood or that that it, it's all it's frowned upon. It's, you know, in some ways that this is so I'm already burdened by the duties of, of motherhood. And this is a particularly overwhelming situation. So what would you say to the sister that came to me in the masjid with this statement and to sisters yeah. that might that have that specific circumstance? Actually, it's the one, number one most common question I get from women before and after Gaza. Mm. Exactly. And one of the first thing I'll start even before Gaza, and I said this, I think there's a clip about that because I see it in my office, Sheikh Omar. She comes to my office, you know, when you take the information, what do you do? You're talking to know the patient first time. What do you do? She put her head down. I was like, I'm a stay home mom. This is the way. It's not only the face, but the way she say it, like I'm stay home mom. Or actually, she said, I'm just stay home mom. And I say, just, just. The, I, you know what I say? The only profession that Allah taught, lim, linked it with Jannah, right? Oh. The only profession <laughs> that Allah linked it with Jannah, right? Is, and again, we may, we, some may disagree about the strength of the hadith, but at least it was mentioned Jannah. There was no Jannah for physicians. There's no Jannah for engineers, IT. I think number one, mothers need to change the way they look at themselves when they are mothers. She stayed home to take care of her children. That will get you to Jannah if you do it well. And this is as important. If Anna, to me, it's even more important than any other you do. What do I do when I'm overwhelmed and I don't blame anybody because there's so many things that the pace of this life, the expectation puts a lot of burden on the woman, right? The, the, the notion of the superwoman, which there is no superwoman or there is no superman. We're human beings. But that's what we are being fed day and night. You can do it. You can do it. What I say the following, if I am a mother and I have my children, I think the best thing these days mothers and fathers, is you need to teach them what is all Palestine about. There is jahil, ya Sheikh Omar. I mean, you ask people a couple of questions. What happened in 48? What happened in 67? What is 67? And the people who are younger, they don't even know what happened in 2000. Who's Muhammad al-Durra? Nobody. Oh. I think mothers, yeah, wallah. And it was like, yeah, nice. oh. if you only saw that picture, that picture in, 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 in print in your, in your brain, Mothers do the following. He gave you the children. That means with you taking care of the children, you will be able to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and serve this, uh, what is happening. Teach them. You don't know, get information. You read it with them and you will learn. And they will learn. That's number one. Number two, since time is very limited with all what motherhood and being a wife, and if she works also add to it, how much I need to see, and I say this to myself also, how much you need to see to move your heart? 
right? One or two, and you read one or two article. The rest is, I have to ask myself, is it making me closer to Allah? Is, is seeing the third and the fourth is making my dua better? Most of the time the answer is no, because I will reach a point, I'm helpless, I'm sad, I feel useless. Then you need to limit on this. Stay connected, know what is going on, but don't spend, and this is by the way, to men and women. Because I, what I got also is like, my husband is doing nothing, he's, he's glued to that TV. And now every the, the mood the mood in the house is all everybody is depressed, and we can't do that. I need to get informed, stay informed, but teach your children. Number one, number two, teach people around you in schools, like you're taking your child to the school dropping right part of the day. Life has to continue, so you you're gonna stop your car whatever, and then you're gonna come down. Then the mother comes in, start a conversation in a nice way. I mean, it's not a lecture. Then you feel you are not helpless. You feel you are doing something. Get all your ch uh, children friends, the girls or the boys, you know, get them together, go out if the weather allows. And then also in between, don't give lectures, but introduce. I think once we all feel we are doing something, we don't feel I'm useless. Mm -hmm. I need to organize my time. I need to focus. How can I help? If I don't know how, Turn to Allah and use the famous dua. I love it. Allahumma sta'milni wa la tastabdilni. Ya Allah, use me and don't replace me. He will open the doors uh, for you. I'll give you a simple story as I was flying this weekend for a program. So it was Thursday and it was a short day. I said, let me see if I can fast. And if it's going to be uh, difficult, alhamdulillah. In the plane, the, she came to me and says, do you want to eat something? I said, no, thank you. And I... Then she came another hour. It was a four hours and a half flight. She came. Is it? Is it now? Uh, do you want anything? I said maybe later. She was very nice. Third time she came, and I said, "Khalas, I'm gonna say it, right?" And I said, "After sunset." Is oh, mm -hmm. So sunset comes in. I press the button. She was very close to me. I said, "I know it's time for food." She came to me. You know what she said? She said, "I'm so sorry. I should not have offered you food." I wish I knew. Oh. Subhanallah. So this is what we all have to do is we can do a lot by doing our daily life. You don't have to stop. Can't. Again, mothers, fathers, busy people, use whatever time you have, but ask Allah to use you. Ask Allah to use you. And I think number one now is teaching our this generation what is going on and teach them how to respond in the right way. Say the right thing, do the right thing, what it pleases Allah. It's parallel to your point, by the way, and that was an incredible answer. The challenge that we have of nurturing yaqeen in the next generation is a mighty challenge. And the challenge of making sure that all of the implications of this cause, I'm not talking about the cause of Palestine alone, this cause of Islam, are sufficiently rooted in the hearts of this next generation is a mighty, mighty challenge. And that's what our deen is. It's succession. How do we pass this on? How do we pass this on? How do we pass this on? And subhanAllah, you know, I, I, I look at my own mother, may Allah have mercy on her. You know, I was one of the, one of the most surreal moments of my life. Um, my mother had uh, multiple strokes and one of the strokes, she, she had a hard time speaking. It was very hard to understand her when she, when she would speak, but she was, it was a test from Allah because she actually was a, one of her bachelor's degrees was in Arabic literature. She was a sh she was a poet, so yeah. for her to not be able to to speak and and you know people to understand her is very tough. Uh, it's a very tough challenge for her. But she kept writing, and she'd write these poems and poems and poems. And I have it in this little yellow notebook of hers. She'd draw these cartoons, and sometimes even these cartoons were on like uh, little bank papers or whatever it is, just whatever she could get a hold of. She just draw these cartoons that are about her feelings. And subhanAllah, she wrote, a Palestinian woman wrote a, a poem about Sarajevo, the Bosnian genocide. And I had the opportunity to read that poem in Sarajevo from my Palestinian mother for a genocide tribunal for Kashmir. <laughs> so subhanAllah, <laughs> look at all this. Right. Together. I'm, like, I'm, I'm like, I'm sure when she was writing this, she did not expect that I'd take that poem with me to Sarajevo, read it to, to people that lived through that terror. 
in a genocide tribunal about Kashmir, because that, that's what had gathered us at the moment. Um, but subhanAllah, my, my parents nurtured that cause in my heart. And so, I mean, that she she did not know what she was doing at the time. Um, but alhamdulillah, you know, so uh, it, at the end of the day, Allah will make amazing things come out of these small things that we think are insignificant, right? It seems so insignificant. I mean, it's little, uh, literally her poems are written on the cheapest type of paper, you know, subhanAllah, but they're the, the richest of words, subhanAllah. So you, you just know, don't you know. You said it beautifully, Sheikh Omar. I think we need to broad, broaden the way we serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we all now think, you know, I have to write a book. I have to go and give a lecture. I think number one, and you said it beautifully. We had a very recently meeting about, you know, planning for a youth, for a whole year, a youth program. And the question always comes up, what does the youth need? And I'm going to say not only the youth. But yani, the people, let's say 30 and below, you know what they what they are missing is the yaqeen and the aqeedah. They that, you know, we grew up, that's that's taken. Yani. But now with all the fast pace and all what's they are bombarded. I think the number one is teach this younger generation who is he, subhana, who's Allah. I mean, your mother grew up knowing this, right? Mm -hmm. So when anything comes up, it's it's naturally comes out the feeling because that's what pleases Allah. I think we all and back again to the any of the woman who comes to you and come to me and listening to us and even fathers is where do I start with my children in this day and age today with what everything happening to us? Start with teaching them about Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Don't tell them, did you pray? Ask them, how was your conversation with Allah? It's a complete different way of looking at salah. You know, did you ask him? Did you beg him? Don't say go and make dua. We need to engrave in our children because everything else outside is not, who reminds you of Allah outside? It's all me, me, I, I. I think if we put this and we take this opportunity of what, this is what the children of Gaza have. Uh -huh. Because that's their life. That's their life. Hafaz Quran. Did you see the young boy reading the Quran? And he is in the middle of the rubbles. Uh -huh. He was 10, 12 years old, right? And reading uh -huh. the verse of the Quran that you needed at that moment, right? And I looked at him when I was looking at him, beautiful voice. And I said, Who taught you that? You're uh -huh. 12 years old. You're under occupation. That's his parents. And that's the society around him. This is what we need. This is what we need also. And then we don't feel helpless and hopeless back again. And then you never know. Yani, your mother, may Allah give her jannah for those. And my mom and all our mothers and parents. Ya Rabbi Ami. When she wrote it, did she know that's what's going to happen? No. She just poured her heart and mm -hmm. left it. As I just shared with you before the program, I learned this from one of the teachers actually when I was studying. She was telling me, don't belittle any good deed you do. You never know. This could be that one that will save you in the sight of Allah. So let's do it. All. Yeah, so it might be the one that saves you. That's what the, the statement is. Exactly. That may, may be. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy. May Allah give us this clarity, as you said, the people of Gaza they have. And then when we read about the Sahaba and read in the book, they see it. You know, the Sahaba, you told us, I, I see it. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Barakallahu feekum, uh, Dr. Haifa, I really enjoyed, subhanAllah, your, your insights. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, and inshallah, we hope to see you again and again um, on, on many different programs, with ta'ala with us. Uh, may Allah azza wa jalla bless you and accept from you. Amen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, show mercy to our brothers and sisters in Gaza, accept their dead, shahada, heal their wounded, and Amen. lift from them the siege and free uh, Palestine, all of it, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Masjid al-Aqsa, liberate it, Ameen. allow us to pray in it. Ameen. Soon, bidna na'i ta'ala all together and then gather us all in the Firdaus al-A'la. Allahumma Ameen. Ameen.
may Allah reward you for everything you do. May Allah put barakah in yaqeen. All of you are doing amazing job. And may Allah use us all, Ya Rabbi Amin, for his sake and for his pleasure. Ya Rabbi Amin. And inshallah we'll meet again bi-idhnillah. Jazakum Allah khairah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.